Hello friends and welcome to this special Halloween edition of Sleep Story. Tonight I shall be reading for you two somewhat curious and strange short fairy tales of old. Their reading will be followed by about an hour of gently blowing wind to help you drift to sleep. If you enjoy these narrations, I would encourage you to subscribe. Before we begin, let us unwind. Find that special place, that place where you can relax and forget about the day. Get comfortable, settle down, close your eyes, and take a deep breath. You can feel your body relax. Take another deep breath, and let us begin these curious stories. The Riddle a king's son once had a great desire to travel through the world, so he started off, taking no one with him but one trusty servant. One day he came to a great forest, and as evening drew on, he could find no shelter, and could not think where to spend the night. All of a sudden he saw a girl going towards a little house, and as he drew nearer, he remarked that she was both young and pretty. He spoke to her and said, Dear child, could I and my servants spend the night in this house? Oh, yes, said the girl in a sad tone. You can, if you like, but I should not advise you to do so. Better not go in. Why not? asked the king's son. The girl sighed and answered, My stepmother deals in black arts, and she is not very friendly to strangers. The prince guessed easily that he had fallen on a witch's house. But as by this time it was quite dark, and he could go no further, and as moreover he was not at all afraid, he stepped in. An old woman, sat in an armchair near the fire, and as the strangers entered, she turned her red eyes on them. Good evening, she muttered, and pretending to be quite friendly. Won't you sit down? She blew up the fire on which she was cooking something in a little pot, and her daughter secretly warned the travelers to be very careful not to eat or drink anything, as the old woman's brews were apt to be dangerous. They went to bed and slept soundly till morning. When they were ready to start, and the king's son had already mounted his horse, the old woman said, Wait a minute, I must give you a stirrup cup. Whilst she went to fetch it, the king's son rode off and the servant who had waited to tighten his saddle girths was alone when the witch returned. Take that to your master, she said, but as she spoke the glass cracked and the poisons spurted over the horse, and it was so powerful that the poor creature sank down dead. The servant ran after his master and told him what had happened. And then, not wishing to lose the saddle as well as the horse, he went back to fetch it. When he got to the spot, he saw that a raven had perched on the carcass and was pecking at it. Who knows whether we shall get anything better to eat today, said the servant. And he shot the raven and carried it off. 
Then they rode on all day through the forest without coming to the end. At nightfall they reached an inn, which they entered, and the servant gave the landlord a raven to dress for the supper. Now, as it happened, this inn was a regular resort of a band of murderers, and the old witch, too, was in the habit of frequenting it. As soon as it was dark, twelve murderers arrived, with the full intention of killing and robbing the strangers. Before they set to work, however, they sat down to table, and the landlord and the old witch joined them, and they all ate some broth in which the flesh of the raven had been stewed down. They had hardly taken a couple of spoonfuls when they all fell dead for the poison had passed from the horse to the raven, and so into the broth. So there was no one left belonging to the house, but the landlord's daughter, who was a good, well-meaning girl, and had taken no part in all the evil doings. She opened all the doors and showed the strangers the treasures the robbers had gathered together but the prince bade her keep them all for herself, as he wanted none of them, and so he rode further with his servant. After traveling about for some length of time, they reached a town where lived a lovely but most arrogant princess. She had given out that anyone who asked her a riddle, which she found herself unable to guess, should be her husband. But should she guess it, he must forfeit his head. She claimed three days in which to think over the riddles, but she was so very clever that she invariably guessed them in a much shorter time. Nine suitors had already lost their lives when the king's son arrived, and dazzled by her beauty, determined to risk his life in hopes of winning her. So he came before her and propounded his riddle. What is this? he asked. One slew none and yet killed twelve. She could not think what it was. She thought and thought and looked through all her books of riddles and puzzles, but she found nothing to help her and could not guess. In fact, she was at her wit's end. As she could think of no way to guess the riddle, she ordered her maid to steal at night into the prince's bedroom and to listen, for she thought that he might perhaps talk aloud in his dreams, and so betray the secret. But the clever servant had taken his master's place, and when the maid came, he tore off the cloak she had wrapped herself in, and hunted her off with a whip. On the second night, the princess sent her lady-in-waiting, hoping that she might succeed better, but the servant took away her mantle and chased her away also. On the third night, the king's son thought he really might feel safe, so he went to bed but in the middle of the night the princess came herself, all huddled up in a misty grey mantle, and sat down near him. When she thought he was fast asleep, she spoke to him, hoping he would answer in the midst of his dreams, as many people do. But he was wide awake all the time, and heard and understood everything very well. Then she asked, One slew none, what is that? And he answered, A raven which fed on the carcass of a poisoned horse. She went on, And yet killed twelve, what is that? Those are twelve murderers who ate the raven and died of it. As soon as she knew the riddle, she tried to slip away but he held her mantle so tightly that she was obliged to leave it behind. 
Next morning, the princess announced that she had guessed the riddle, and sent for the twelve judges, before whom she declared it. But the young men begged to be heard too, and said, She came by night to question me, otherwise she never could have guessed it. The judges said, Bring us some proof. So the servant brought out the three cloaks. And when the judges saw the grey one, which the princess was in habit of wearing, they said, Let it be embroidered with gold and silver. It shall be your wedding mantle. Jack my Hedgehog there was once a farmer who lived in great comfort. He had both lands and money. But though he was so well off, one thing was wanting to complete his happiness. He had no children. Many and many a time, when he met other farmers at the nearest market town, they would tease him, asking how it came about that he was childless. At length he grew so angry that he exclaimed, I must and will have a child of some sort or kind, even should it only be a hedgehog. Not long after this his wife gave birth to a child, but though the lower half of the little creature was a fine boy, from the waist upwards it was a hedgehog, so that when his mother first saw him she was quite frightened and said to her husband, There now, you have cursed the child yourself. The farmer said, What's the use of making a fuss? I suppose the creature must be christened, but I don't see how we are to ask anyone to be sponsor to him. And what are we to call him? There is nothing we can possibly call him but Jack my Hedgehog, replied the wife. So they took him to be christened, and the parson said, you never be able to put that child in a decent bed on account of his prickles. Which was true. But they shook down some straw from behind the stove, and there he lay for eight years. His father grew very tired of him, and often wished him dead. But he did not die but lay on there year after year. Now one day there was a big fair at the market town to which the farmer meant to go. So he asked his wife what he should bring her from it. Some meat and a couple of big loaves for the house, said she. Then he asked the maid what she wanted, and she said a pair of slippers and some stockings. Lastly, he said, Well, Jack, my hedgehog, and what shall I bring you? Daddy, said he, do bring me a bagpipe. When the farmer came home, he gave his wife and the maid the things they had asked for, and then he went behind the stove and gave Jack, my hedgehog, the bagpipes. When Jack had got his bagpipes, he said, Daddy, do go to the smithy and have the house cook shod for me. Then I'll ride off and trouble you no more. His father, who was delighted at the prospect of getting rid of him, had the cook shod, and when it was ready, Jack my hedgehog mounted on its back and rode off to the forest, followed by all the pigs and asses, which he had promised to look after. Having reached the forest, he made the cock fly up to the top of a very tall tree with him, and there he sat looking after his pigs and donkeys, and he sat on and on for several years, till he had quite a big beard. But all this time his father knew nothing about him. As he sat up in his tree, he played away on his pipes, and drew the loveliest music from them. As he played one day, a king, who had lost his way, happened to pass close by, and hearing the music he was much surprised, 
and sent one of his servants to find out where it came from. The man peered about, but he could see nothing but a little creature which looked like a cock, with a hedgehog sitting on it, perched up in a tree. The king desired the servant to ask the strange creature why it sat there, and if it knew the shortest way to his kingdom. On this, Jack my hedgehog stepped down from his tree and said he would undertake to show the king his way home if the king on his part would give him his written promise to let him have whatever first met him on his return. The king thought to himself, that's easy enough to promise. The creature won't understand a word about it, so I can just write what I choose. So he took pen and ink and wrote something, and when he had done, check my hedgehog pointed out the way, and the king got safely home. Now, when the king's daughter saw her father, returning in the distance, she was so delighted that she ran to meet him and threw herself into his arms. Then the king remembered Jack my hedgehog, and he told his daughter how he had been obliged to give a written promise to bestow whatever he first met when he got home on an extraordinary creature, which had shown him the way. The creature, said he, rode on a cock as though it had been a horse, and it made lovely music, but as it certainly could not read, he had just written that he would not give it anything at all. At this the princess was quite pleased, and said how cleverly her father had managed for that, of course, nothing would induce her to have gone off with Jack my Hedgehog. Meantime, Jack minded his asses and pigs, sat aloft in his tree, played his bagpipes, and was always merry and cheery. After a time, it so happened that another king, having lost his way, passed by with his servants and escort wondering how he could find his way home, for the forest was very vast. He too heard the music and told one of his men to find out whence it came. The man came under the tree, and looking up to the top, there he saw Jack the Hedgehog astride on the cock. The servant asked Jack what he was doing up there. I am minding my pigs and donkeys. But what do you want? was the reply. Then the servant told him they had lost their way, and wanted someone to show it them. Then down came Jack my hedgehog with his cock, and told the old king he would show him the right way if he would solemnly promise to give him the first thing he met in front of his royal castle. The king said yes, and gave Jack a written promise to that effect. Then Jack rode on in front, pointing out the way, and the king reached his own country in safety. Now he had an only daughter who was extremely beautiful, and who, delighted at her father's return, ran to meet him, threw his arms round his neck, and kissed him heartily. Then she asked where he had been wandering so long, and he told her how he had lost his way, and might never have reached home at all, but for a strange creature, half man, half hedgehog, which rode a cock and sat up in a tree making lovely music, and which had shown him the right way. He also told her how he had been obliged to pledge his word to give the creature the first thing which met him outside his castle gate and he felt very sad at the thought that she had been the first thing to meet him. But the princess comforted him, and said she should be quite willing to go with Jack my hedgehog whenever he came to fetch her, because of the great love she bore to her dear old father. Jack my hedgehog continued to hurt his pigs, and they increased in number, till there were so many that the forest seemed full of them. 
So he made up his mind to live there no longer, and sent a message to his father, telling him to have all the stables and outhouses in the village cleared, as he was going to bring such an enormous herd, that all who would might kill what they chose. His father was much vexed at this news, for he thought Jack had died long ago. Jack my hedgehog mounted his cock, and driving his pigs before him into the village, he let everyone kill as many as they chose. Then said Jack, Daddy, let the blacksmith shoe my cock once more, then I'll ride off, and I promise you I'll never come back again as long as I live. So the father had the cock shot, and rejoiced at the idea of getting rid of his son. Then Jack my Hedgehog set off for the first kingdom, and there the king had given strict orders that if anyone should be seen riding a cock and carrying a bagpipe, he was to be chased away and shot at, and on no account to be allowed to enter the palace. So, when Jack my Hedgehog rode up, the guards charged him with their bayonets. But he put spurs to his cock, flew up over the gate, right to the king's windows, let himself down on the cell, and called out that if he was not given what he had been promised him, both the king and his daughter should pay for it with their lives. Then the king coaxed and entreated his daughter to go with Jack, and so save both their lives. The princess dressed herself all in white, and her father gave her a coach with six horses, and servants in gorgeous liveries, and quantities of money. She stepped into the coach, and Jack my hedgehog, with his cock and pipes, took his place beside her. They both took leave and the king fully expected never to set eyes on them again. But matters turned out very differently from what he had expected, for when they had got a certain distance from the town, Jack tore all the princess's smart clothes off her and pricked her all over with his bristles, saying, That's what you get for treachery. Now go back, I'll have no more to say to you and with that he hunted her home. And she felt she had been disgraced and put to shame till her life's end. Then Jack my Hedgehog rode on with his cock and bagpipes to the country of the second king to whom he had shown the way. Now this king had given orders that in the event of Jack's coming the guards were to present arms the people to cheer, and he was to be conducted in triumph to the royal palace. When the king's daughter saw Jack my Hedgehog, she was a good deal startled, for he certainly was very peculiar looking. But after all, she considered that she had given her word and it couldn't be helped. So she made Jack welcome, and they were betrothed to each other. And at dinner he sat next to her at the royal table, and they ate and drank together. When they retired to rest, the princess feared lest Jack should kiss her, because of his prickles. But he told her not to be alarmed, as no harm should befall her. Then he begged the old king to place a watch of four men just outside his bedroom door and to desire them to make a big fire. When he was about to lie down in bed, he would creep out of his hedgehog skin and leave it lying at the bedside. When the men must rush in, throw the skin into the fire and stand by till it was entirely burnt up. And so it was, for when it struck eleven, Jack, my hedgehog, went to his room, took off his skin, and left it at the foot of the bed. The man rushed in, quickly seized the skin and threw it on the fire, and directly it was all burnt. Jack was released from his enchantment, and lay on his bed a man 
from head to foot. But he was dirty, as though he had been severely scorched. The king sent off for his physician in ordinary, who washed Jack all over with various essences and salves, so that he became clean and was a remarkably handsome young man. When the king's daughter saw him, she was greatly pleased, and next day the marriage ceremony was performed and the old king bestowed his kingdom on Jack my Hedgehog. After some years, Jack and his wife went to visit his father, but the farmer did not recognize him and declared he had no son. He had had one, but that one was born with bristles, like a hedgehog, and had gone off into the white world. Then Jack told his story, and his father rejoiced, and returned to live with him in his kingdom. <laughs>